just start with start. Because it can take a long time to happen. Mm -hmm. Not for the streaming to start. It can. We I have are funded. Start so we are potentially live. We will find out whether we are live in a moment. Hello, we people. want people in the chat to tell us that we are live. Hello, people. I think that we are live. So uh, Sam, Jan, and I are here tonight. We are on speaker view on Zoom. So that means the person who's speaking will be popped to the front. And uh, when Jan says silly things and does silly poses, he will pop to the front. So this is me. If you can hear me, say I can hear Ben in the chat. Hey, Sam, say hello. Hello, people of the chat. I haven't got the chat open, so I can't tell. Ben will have to tell me whether you, you can hear me or not. That's my job. So hello, I'm in charge of chat today. Funded. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> that's very exciting. So that's it, right? We're no more live streams. We just go home, right? Yeah, uh, yeah we, we have our first question ask. from Rodrigo, and it says, hi, question mark. So, hi. Sam, hi? Hi. <laughs> Okay, guys. So firstly, we have funded. We have gone. Uh, Jan's terribly excited. He's jiggling around with it. In fact, I'm going to put this on a different view. I'm going to put it on gallery view. Then you can see Jan dancing every few seconds. It's not necessarily for our benefit, but uh, there you go. So we funded. Awesome. Like Thank you very maybe. much, guys. First stretch goal in sight is 35,000, which is Steam multiplayer, on which, for which we will be heavily leaning on Sam for his experience from uh, the Unreal multiplayer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm just pulling a funny face because uh, I know how painful that was. But uh... And also because we haven't told him before just now. So, yeah, surprise! Yeah, so this is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pressa. so, Sam, uh, what I want to do is just kick this off straight onto the topic, which is yep. conscious coding or conscious game programming is the title. Sam, just give us a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight, and then we'll start yeah. diving in. Topics yeah, so what we're talking about is uh, basically the idea that when you have looked at a lot of different programming languages, different engines, you're going to see a lot of different techniques and a lot of different tools being used in those different languages and programming, no, programming languages and engines. Um, so we're going to be giving an overview of some of the concepts that are different or shared between Godot and Unity and Unreal. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be talking about quite ignorantly about Godot, and I'm going to <laughs> concentrate on these guys to uh, to tell me where I'm wrong. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to be talking in broad strokes about programming concepts like dynamic programming languages versus static programming languages, and there's a whole bunch of other things which I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, inheritance versus composition, uh, composition versus aggregation. So there's lots of verses going on here because we've got different kind of um, slants on programming and everything has its pros and cons there's no right way of doing things um and so we're going to talk about pros and cons and i'm hopefully going to engage the audience you guys um and ben and yan to uh come up with some pros and cons and it won't just be me uh droning on in a monotone at you <laughs> that's them the, and yeah both of you uh, we're being told have issues with your audio sync i think the best way to potentially fix that would be to try just stopping and restarting a video and if that doesn't work you could dive out and dive back into the chat i'll do that because mine is okay okay so, there's always going to be a slight audio well maybe yeah it's not too bad on yours now yan say something um i am a little teapot covered in jam yeah, it's looking okay from my end. Um, yeah, it looks okay from my end, so it would be strange. And uh, I just want to do a real quick thank you to Ben. He went above and beyond and bought a whole bunch of extra hardware today. So, Andy, when you say we all sound the same sound levels today, that's because Ben has been going above and beyond. So, cheers, Ben. No worries. I'm trying to get it working. It's just streaming is seeming to be a, a black art here, trying to get it all working, especially when I've got these weird load balance broadband lines that may or may not be interfering with it. But anyway, hopefully a day well spent. So... Sam, let's uh, let's start off with uh, well, let's go through your slide deck. By the way, people in the YouTube description, if you sh click show more, you should see a link to the Google Slides presentation, so that you can see the slides that Sam is going to bring up. Yeah. Okay. So um, here are said slides. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was it, it's kind of the big the big issue is dynamic programming, which is probably if you're coming from any of our other courses, you won't have come across dynamic programming before because uh, we've been using C++ and C Sharp, um, and they're both statically typed, what well, known as statically typed programming languages. And basically what that means is that to you, this these two lines of code 
look like a massive no-no. It's just like, that shouldn't be able to happen, right? You've got, you're implicitly looking at employee name and saying, well, if it's equal to nine, then that should be of type int. And so on the second line, we should get an error when we're trying to assign a string. So what a dynamically typed programming language does is it says, actually, you know, you can, the, the variable is just a name. It's just this box that we can put anything into. Uh, and that's what's, that's the case with Godot. So you can put anything into these boxes. And you might think, why is that ever a good idea? Um, and the, the reason that can be a good idea is because you can write really quickly very generic reusable code, such as this add function. I mean, this is a trivial example, but you can think of examples where it gets much more complicated. And I don't have to say anything special about the type of X and Y. Depending on what I pass in, it's going to try and do the right thing. So if I pass in an int and an int, it'll use the add operation for integers. If I do um, a string and a string like hello and world, then it's going to try and add the two strings together. So it basically says, um, well, one of the classic things, especially that they say in Python about dynamic typing, is that if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. So you don't have to go around saying this thing is a duck. You just have to go around saying, I want it to quack and I want it to walk. Um, so that's something very powerful in dynamic programming languages. Um, and I'd be interested, Jan, in, in your experience, having done some Godot scripting, GD scripting, how that's working out. Well, I, I just stopped very sharing helpful. Screen, I'm sorry, when, once, uh, once, once yeah. we get back to the talking, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah so. Um, I'm finding it very helpful, to be honest, because as a lot of people here know, I, I'm one of the few people in the company that don't have a comp sci degree. I, I'm very much self-taught my coding, which meant that when I first came across Unity, I understood the concepts, but I kept like tripping myself up of, what, is this the right type and all the rest of it? With GD script, if I need to specify the type, or if I need to cast it to a different type, which Ben doesn't like me doing, but occasionally you have to do, um, it can get in the way. But as you're going across and you're just trying to make, I just want this code to work, I don't have to do, okay, this is my integer code, this is my float code and everything else. I can just go, here is my code and it runs. Mm -hmm. uh, face is still a little low in frame. Got a secret message. <gasps> um, awesome. So, so Sam, maybe we could overview for context for people uh, what looks like your next slide, which is a dynamic typing in different uh, game engines. So we can have a look and see um, see what the options are, et cetera. Yeah, so, um, well, basically the ones you've done so far have actually pretty much all been static. So C Sharp can, I'm saying mostly static here because there are some options to have un, untyped variables. And so you can do some kind of un, dynamically typed stuff. And in C++, if you're really keen, you can uh, store things in pointers and have a void star pointer to things, but I really don't recommend you do that. Um, but, so there is ways of, Kind of hacking dynamic typing into the language. Um, of course there is, because that's how other programming languages with dynamic typing are actually implemented on the same hardware. So there has to be a way with these programming languages, there's always a way of programming into them. Um, but it's all about what it makes um, most easy for you to do. And obviously GD script is dynamic here. So when you're saying um, you're casting YAN, is it, it's, then it's a runtime decision, isn't it? Because we're, what we're saying with dynamic typing is that we're not going to check the types when we compile before we play. So often what you'll see with C Sharp, C++, and even Blueprint is that before you hit play, it will give you an error and say, hey, you can't store this float in this integer variable, for example. Um, whereas with a dynamically typed language, it's going to wait until the last possible minute when it sees you actually do the assignment and when that assignment's actually happening at runtime. And that's when you're going to have the error come up, which can be a bit annoying sometimes, especially if that code is buried deep in some corner case somewhere in your game and you have to test for hours to get there and then it crashes at that moment saying, oh, you've tried to assign a float um, where we needed an integer or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, very much so. It's, um, I'll let Ben do that bit or you can do that bit. Um, the case I was doing the other day, Ben was reviewing my code for a platform game for the Hoppy Days thing. And uh, this is when I discovered the expression code smell, which we were discussing the other day, because I came up with this really nifty thing. Actually, I'm not the only person to come up with it, but I, I came up with this and so other people have done this. What if I report 
are you moving left? Subtract, are you moving right? I'm going to take the true false value, turn it into an integer, subtract one from the other, mm. and then cast it into a thing. And Ben's like, yeah, it'll let you do that, but why are you doing that? Like, if you don't have a reason, you, you've got something weird with your code. And so it's one of those things where the advantage of being able to just have everything free until the last minute where I say, okay, now transfer this into this type. As long as I have a good reason, that's solid. But if it's not, then the kind of bugs you're talking about is like, and then 10 months later on your full game, your entire combat system crashed because you forgot someone did that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And exactly, that's the problem. I mean, maybe you pass in then something that can't be so easily converted into an integer and everything falls down around your ears. Um, but you won't know because it's in some bit of the code that doesn't get reached until level 10 or something. Yeah. Um, so that is one of the major arguments against, and that kind of brings us on to the kind of pro and con side, which is just a blank thing to discuss, so I won't bring it up. But pros, uh, pros and cons of dynamic typing is obviously you've got this immense flexibility, and yep. it's really fast and really quick way to prototype. But sometimes you'll want to go over to a statically typed programming language when your program is getting really large because you want to, in general, in programming, we want to be told about errors as early as possible. So we don't want to have to wait until level 10 to be told that something's going wrong. We want to, if possible, have it told to us at compile time, which is pretty much as soon as it's possible to say. Yeah. And, and there's also another benefit here, isn't there, Sam, which is that w with a statically typed language like C Sharp, you get even more capability in the, in the uh, IDE normally for refactoring and more safe refactoring because the IDE can know more about the language structure than it can. I mean, things like PyCharm go a long way in Python to bridge that gap by just being clever, but in general, you're safer and easier and quicker to refactor, which is hugely important to me. Well, exactly, because you can think of it like this. In, in a dynamic language, the IDE and the compiler can never truly know what variable is, uh, what type is going to be stored in a variable. Because in a dynamic language, I can write something like, if user types hello, put an integer into this variable. If user types world, put a float into this variable. So the compiler can't possibly know what the user is going to type. So it can't possibly know what the type of the variable is going to be. So that's a very kind of contrived example. But what actually happens in the real world is much more complicated than that. And your user inputs and your user interaction filters down in very unpredictable ways. So unless you're constraining the code, such as with a static type system, your IDE and your compiler before the program is running can't actually know uh, how to refactor things, whether a refactor is safe. So it relies much more heavily on the programmer going, well, I know that that variable will never be used in that way. Um, and yeah, so it relies very much on programmers subscribing to contracts. So it's a great prototyping tool, absolutely fantastic prototyping tool because you can be super flexible. I mean, Ben, you were talking about how much easier it was in a dynamically typed language to import something like a JSON data structure. Yeah, let me, let me show people that. And also then, then we'll get on to, there's a couple of great questions. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Mm. Let's just show a couple of things. So uh, firstly, let's talk about uh, Looney Lips, which is one of the projects in the Kickstarter, of course. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're welcome to slam a, I'll do that, uh, KSGDT. There's a link to the Kickstarter in the chat. For those of you, that one person on the entire stream who hasn't already seen the Kickstarter. So what we've got in this game is text. We're starting to take all text out of the game code mainly because I've got to translate all the GD script into C Sharp, and I don't want text in the code. There's another reason as well. In general, you shouldn't have strings in your code. The same way as we tell you that numbers that aren't 0, 1, or 2 are magic numbers in your code, any string really is what you could call a magic string in your code. So we're taking them out. So what I want to show you very briefly is that this file, which hopefully you can see there, is called stories.json, and it is just a dictionary uh, sorry, it's actually an array of dictionaries. So you've got one dictionary here, which tells you about a prompt and a story, and then another, and then another, and then another, okay? That's one structure. For another part of the game, we've got the, uh, where is it? Uh, other strings.json, which is different, which is simply just a, uh, what is that? That is just dictionary. a list of dictionaries. It's just a dictionary. 
It's, it's just, just a, this one's just a dictionary. Okay, so we've got two different types here: stories, which is an array of dictionaries, and then other strings, which is just a dictionary. So they're completely different types. Those two things. Now, what's interesting in a dynamic language is this: is that uh, regardless of which of these different data structures you're using, and they're both appropriate to their use, if you have a look over here in loonylips.gd, and by the way, Lars is gonna Lars um, has got something to say about. Uh, us using JSON at all, and it may not make it in its current form into the course, but this just demonstrates the point, is that I've written a simple function here, which is get from JSON. You give it a file name, goes and opens the file, goes and gets the file as text, parses it as JSON and returns it and closes the file, right? But the interesting thing is where you call it. Look at this. In one method, we say the strings, all the strings in the game that we're gonna use, and there's just a variable, again, it works out the type, go and get it from JSON. What's that gonna make? It's gonna make a dictionary. but a few lines later, we say var stories equals get from JSON, go and get from a different file. What do we get now? Now we get a, an array of dictionaries, completely different data structure. Mm -hmm. And the code to get from JSON is the same in both cases and would not be exactly the same in C Sharp without using generics or some other clever yeah. tricks. So you have so to do all sorts of clever tricks in, the, in statically typed languages to say, this is like, honestly compiler i have thought about this and this is well constrained yep. whereas here in a dynamically typed language you don't have to the, the compiler isn't molly molly coddling you into trying to you know m make sure that you're using the right types basically. and if you're still not convinced on why that's awesome um if you want to do a use case well let's say we're making an rpg right and we have characters and they have names and they have stats and they have descriptions and they have inventories that can be a single dictionary because in a dynamically typed language like uh, GBScript, you don't have to have the same value type throughout your dictionary or throughout your array. Uh, position one or uh, value one can be a string, value two can be an integer, value three can be an array, and you can add and remove them on the fly. So yep. as long as the programmer has a clear idea of what's happening, the code will allow that. In, some, in a, a statically typed language, of course you can do that but it's going to take a lot of work to get to that point. Like it's not out of the box. You're gonna to have to write that solution for yourself. Yeah, or you might end up having to do nasty things like um, casting. So you, if you wanted to do something like this, you would probably have to put some kind of very generic type into the dictionary. And then you grab things out of the dictionary and say, well, I know it's of this type, so I'm gonna cast it to that. And I mean, for most of us, that probably makes our skin crawl the idea of having to do that. Um, but, you know, in some ways that is dynamic programming, but in a, in a statically programmed language, it's just much, much uglier. <laughs> because yeah. it's going against what that language is built for, right? You're, you're hacking the language to be something that's not. Let's take some of these questions. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, let's get a couple of questions smashed out. Okay, um, do, 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 let's go back to the top. Derek. What about type mismatches, e.g. add to comma hello? You can't, it won't let you. You can't add two different value types. Add to comma hello. So number two? Yeah, so that won't work unless there is a, an operation that supports both or you both of the cast types. one into the other. If you cast two, it to be a string or yeah. Hello. Well, ca cast is cast is an interesting. I wouldn't call it casting. Right? You're converting, right? Converting. Fair. Because um, casting is is a term that we usually use when we're talking about um, statically typed languages, where we're saying we're, we're basically dropping down into dynamically typing. Yeah. Because we're saying, I know that you think it's this type, but I know that it's actually this type, and it's often. Um, You've got two types of cast in a statically typed language. You've got an up cast and a down cast, and I can never quite remember which way around they are. But one of them is safe and one of them isn't. Right. Basically, one of them is saying, I'm going I this is um, a specialization of this other type, and I'm going to cast it up to the more general type. And that's always possible and that's always safe. What's not always safe is I've got a general type, and I happen to think or happen to know as a programmer that it is the more specialized type, and I'm going to downcast it to the specialized type. Yep. and just hope that it really was an instant of that specialized type. Otherwise, everything's going to go wrong. Um, so that's, yeah, sorry, just a little bit of a... No, that's fair. Um, question here from Jashlin. Do you think Kotlin-like features may get included in GD script? Uh, I have no um, idea. <laughs> I don't know enough about Kotlin, sadly. 
Uh, it's a very interesting language that's come up on my radar. But um, what kind of language is Kotlin? Because I know very little about it. Um, from what I can tell, statically typed. It's statically um, typed, but I think it has kind of in um, type inference. The reason I'm asking is because with GD Native, which we were discussing in the last stream, and we've touched on it a couple of other streams, um, you can write your own. I guess wrapper to bring in other languages. That's the whole point of it, right? So it's so, quite uh, possible that you might just you can bring in Pascal. So if, in right, so you can program uh, Godot in Ruby if you want. So if that language isn't in there, you could either commission somebody or yourself write that wrapper, and then you can bring in the language yourself. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Awesome, guys. So let's summarize. Let's summarize dynamic versus statically typed, and then um, move on to another aspect of um, of. The comparison. So let's just look for any questions, Jan, that relate to those two. One was Yaza was saying, or Yasa was saying, is there a performance difference? Does there fundamentally need to be a performance difference between uh, statically and dynamically typed? Of course, we see Python is dynamically typed and is slow, but that does not necessarily mean there's a fundamental reason there's a performance um, difference. So, uh, yeah. Sam, what would you take on that? I would say that there is. Uh, it's, I think it's always going to be slightly slower because when you don't know how you're going to have to manage that memory at runtime. So, I mean, performance is a big thing. So it, it might be not slow for your particular application. That's always important to think about. For example, so many websites run on dynamically pro, um, dynamic languages because it doesn't matter how fast the language runs. What matters is the speed of the I.O., the speed of the disk, the speed of retrieving things from the database. So you always have to think about, you know, performance is not just like one thing. It is whatever is your bottleneck. So and also when you're writing a game, it doesn't often matter what the performance of your game glue code is. What really matters is how fast does it render and how fast does it calculate AI and how fast does it do physics. And all that is like special, like performance enhanced C++ running on your GPU and stuff like that. So, you know, it's stuff you generally don't have to touch. So it doesn't matter too much. But I would not go writing very performant code in dynamically typed languages. It just, the compiler doesn't know how to manage the memory efficiently because you haven't given it enough information. And in fact, the okay. Goddard documentation itself will say that. So yes, there is a performance difference. So let me give a little bit of perspective here. So, so it looks like fundamentally dynamically typed languages will be slow because certain types of performance optimizations that could be done in a statically typed language cannot be done by the compiler in, in, in a dynamically typed language. So, and the zoom out from that is, look, you want to make a thing that makes people's lives better so they, you know, you make the world a better place. So you want to make a game and it needs to be fun, let's say. Yep. Um, most of the difficulty of that is not going to be getting it running at a certain number of frames a second. It's going to be being able to iterate fast enough and be creative enough to make something that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to write code as quick as possible to get there. And 90 something percent of your code is not going to be in what we'd call a hot loop, which means that when you actually analyze what code is running, you'll find that it goes and then like that. Yeah. And it's the bit that goes like that, that you want to worry about the performance of, not the digga, 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 okay? Because the digga, 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 whether it goes uh, at 10 inf instructions a second or a thousand may not matter, especially if you're just going from a loading screen into something else or you're, you're in UI or something like that where the computer's kind of twiddling its thumbs. But when it comes to hot loops, render pass, physics calculations, anything that's in a hot loop, that needs to be done properly. The great news is you can start in a, in, in a dynamically typed, simple scripting language you can use a performance profiler, always remember to profile first, to work out what's slow, and then you can port that code. Probably your best bet is straight over to C++. Yep, so yep. absolutely. That's that. And, uh, and yeah, you, as so, people mentioned the sound effects, those are technical terms, jigga, 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 and brrrr. Uh, you can look up the spelling of them online. Yeah, yeah, it's bigger, bigger, bigger. Jigga, jigga, jigga is different. We'll get to that later. They're coming in the next. <laughs> that's the next. Yeah, that's that. That's to do with uh, that. That's to do with declarative programming. We'll get to that. So one other <laughs> question before we go on to the next one, which is Andy was saying, uh, speaking of Python, do we have any plans for a Pi game course? Mm -hmm, maybe. Uh, no, not a whole course on Pi game, but we definitely have plans to go big style, if that's a word, into Python uh, later in the year. And Mikey and I have already been looking at that in some detail. So keep an eye out, everybody on Kickstarter. Do follow us on Kickstarter. And uh, we may just have some Python offering coming up. And that may just have Pygame as a part of it. Awesome. So let's move on then, I think, to the next Absolutely. major topic. 
if that's all right, everybody. I think we've covered most of that. So uh, yeah, the next questions are not specific to this, so we can come back to them. I do have them in the notepad, so that we will get to them. So the next we topic is so about Sam, what is declarative programming? Yes, thank you, Ben. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, <laughs> so declarative programming is where you tell the program, you tell a computer what you want doing, not how you want it doing. So the most obvious type of declarative programming that most people don't even think about as programming is HTML. So mm -hmm. the example I've got here on the, pa on the page is saying, you know, create me a document that has a heading, my first heading, and a paragraph, my first paragraph. And you don't have to write any code that says, how do I display a heading that says my first heading? Some, uh, somewhere else there is code doing that. And the great thing is in declarative programming, you can never have declarative programming that's general purpose. Declarative programming is always specialized to specific domains. So this one is HTML. It is specialized to rendering web pages. And that's all it does. You can't try to write a game very easily in pure HTML, not without something else. So, but there might be declarative programming languages for building games. In fact, there is this one called Godot. And the scene files, particularly in Godot, are a declarative programming language. You are able to put together a lot of components and that describe how you want your game to work. You can put in these animation nodes, you can put it in sprites, and these are all saying how I want this thing to look and behave. And then somewhere else, you write the code that does the how. So essentially you're splitting out the declarative part of the what from the actual implementation part of the how. That's the idea. And it can take a little while to get your head around, actually, because remember that meeting we first had with Lars, where he was pointing out, you've put everything in code. Why didn't you just use a node for that? I'm like, oh, yeah, he can do that, can't you? Yeah. Um, and if you watch the stream with Lars the other day, guys, you'll remember the idea that actually declarative programming is programming. Like, there's no, just because it's written in code, it doesn't mean that's the only way we can do this, or even Absolutely. the best way to do this. It's fundamentally a problem-solving approach, and it can often be... The reason that we often don't use declarative programming is actually out of laziness to think. At least that's what I think. Because when you're using the opposite of declarative programming, which is imperative programming, you are saying you've got so many options. You've got so many different ways of doing it that you don't have to stop and think often. You can just say, oh, I can think of a way of getting to the how. And you don't stop and say, well, hang on, I've got these building blocks what can I make out of those? And often, if you go down the declarative route, you can end up with a very simple solution without even having to write a line of code using other people's off-the-shelf components. And you often use lots of reusable components in that way. It can be quite a mental shift required. So that's going to be really interesting. I mean, it's by no means impossible to do declarative-style stuff in the other game engines. I think it's all about how do the game engines, what direction do they push you in? I mean, if you look at these game engines, I've got Unity on the left here, and it's got a whole setup of components here. And most of these components are telling you what it, what it does, not how. So you've got a box collider and a rigid body. That's saying that the rigid body is going to simulate physics. It's going to, you know, we want this thing to be simulating physics. We want it to have a box collision around it. I'm not interested in the details of how that actually works. And then we've got the player script, which is starting to be a bit more imperative. I mean, we're saying that we want it to be a player, but we're not so much saying what being a player actually means and so on and so forth. Um, I've got an example here from the project I'm working on in, in Unreal, where again, we've got a, a component hierarchy and these components are sort of saying that it wants to interact with widgets, for, for example, um, that this, is, this stroke spawn point is basically saying this is what I, this point is where you should start drawing from and so on and so forth. And then you've got a similar thing going on in Godot by this, this hierarchy. You've got the sprites, as I said, collision cameras and so on. But I get the feeling that Godot is really geared up towards trying to get as much done possible, just putting things together out of nodes and trying to make small, reusable and generic declarative type components to nodes. Sorry. I think so that's... Oh, sorry, Sam. Um, go, go ahead, Yan. And yes, Sam, you might want to kill the uh, kill the kill the screen. screen. 
I think that's fair. It's also worth noting. I, I think the approach difference is, I'm going to go um, sort of tangential here. I used to play an old role-playing game called Shadowrun, and Shadowrun was great, but the problem was it gave you 50 options for every decision. And there are incredible options in that game. If you want to be a cyborg troll who can do this, you can do that. That's fine. But what happened was that everyone always had the th same three or four options and never explored anything else. And that can be a real problem when all the options are presented to you. Godot has a series of nodes which says, okay, this is, here are some ways we can do this. Pick one. So in animation, for instance, you can do tween, you can do animated sprite, you can do animation node, you can do sprite sheets, but effectively those are your options. However, it also allows you to write new nodes. So if you need extra options, you can put them in. But out of the box, they're right here for you, which means, as Sam was saying, you can just get stuff done, right? Mm -hmm. And it's in a way that makes sense to other people, and it's immediately human-readable as well as machine-readable. I mean, the machine can do, you know, um, assembly code if you really needed to. In fact, it would probably prefer it, but I can't. Mm -hmm. So this means that the whole team could just see it, get to work. And then as these guys are saying, if you need that sort of much higher level, very, very fast bend sound effect process, you can then do that in another language. Yeah. And as we, as, so the thing that you can take from using something like Godot, which has this paradigm back into something like Unity is your class design, right? So you saw their player, but as, as if you look in the RPG, as, as your, as your uh, classes get more, your components get more complicated, your, your game entities get more complicated, you start to think in terms of what is the difference between a player and an enemy? Um, well, they're both characters, so that's an inheritance type thing. And in fact, this will lead on in a minute to yeah. uh, composition versus aggregation, etc. But if you've got, when you start writing a player, you kind of do that out of laziness, and then you have an enemy, and then you realize they've got these common traits, they all need to move around, etc. So then you start to like, have components that say, well, there is no player or enemy. These are both characters, um, but, uh, but one of them has AI control and one of them has you know, human player control. So that's an example of a declarative component you put on and say, well, make, put this character under human player control, put this character under AI control, give this character the ability to be damaged, don't give this character the ability to be damaged, and so on. Okay, yeah. so that's kind of putting it together in a declarative, declaring how you want these things to behave. And programming like that, as you'll see a lot more of in the RPG, which, by the way, guys, we will resume work on the RPG very shortly. The bo bottleneck is mainly the fact that Rick is tied up redoing the Unity course, but I'm looking forward to going back into it in a week or two. So that is an example of declarative programming. You very much see us doing that more and more, and you will get better at that when you are in an environment, you spend time in an environment where it, it encourages you to do that. Yeah, I'd say of all of the game engines we do, the game engine that dis well encourages at least, let's say, is Unreal, mm -hmm. um, because you can end up with these god actors that are just thousand line classes with lots of inheritance, and um, you can you can factor it out into components. But be almost because it lets you write logic at the actor level, which is kind of for those people from Unity, um, like writing logic into a game object itself. Um, almost, uh, then you end up with uh, often having these god classes because if you start there and you forget to ever refactor things out. Yeah, and there's um, there's a nice point from Lars who hi Lars, um, who I hope is feeling better. A detail we haven't mentioned yet: declarative code is timeless. Halfway through, um, half through imperative code, you have half through the mod modified state. My reading has gone to poop today, <laughs> um, but there is no half through declarative code. Um, I, I think that's important in the sense that you can, in a declarative language, it, it's very easy to see, oh, it's working, it's not working, and you can just run it like that. But an imperative halfway through the debugging yeah. nightmare. De declarative is closer to functional. If you, think, if you think of something like a piece of regex, um, I think that's perhaps what Lars is, is talking about in the extreme. And you have a, a regex string. You, there is no kind of halfway through that. You have to see the whole thing in totality to work out what it does, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's another, so there's two points there. So yeah, what you've got there is, it's the execution flow. That's what's missing from declarative programming. Execution yeah. flow is about saying, I've got a series of steps and I do one, two, and three. And that's telling you how to do it. If I tell you, go and make a cake, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell a chef how to make a cake. I'm going to tell him to make a cake. I'm not going to give him the steps, the execution yeah. flow of making a cake. That's up to him. 
And uh, therein lies another good habit, of course, Sam, which is order in independent execution. When we're talking about putting our player character together with a character that's under player control and that can take damage, it doesn't matter what order you list those components in in the Unity Inspector, and it shouldn't matter. Oh, no, it really. doesn't make any sense. They all have to kind of operate together. And the, the, so order independent code is important. In fact, with the Unity job system, ECS, et cetera, that's going to become more and more of a thing if we want to go into multi-threaded, thread-safe code. Yeah. So that's one side. Sam, Sam what was your other point? Uh, I can't remember. That's the problem oh, with multiple points. Shit, Jan did that to me yesterday. <laughs> karma. This is, this is circular karma, right? So Jan yeah. blew. I'll shoot you up with my hand. But now, now I'll do it to Jan at some point. Yeah, you've got to do it to Jan. <laughs> it's terrible. Okay. My so thinking. you said there were two points, Sam. You were trying to separate out the, the idea that there was, there was that order, execution and order. But I think you had another point about declarative programming. About, I, I was using the example of regex and a, 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 a you know a half complete regex express, expression is kind of nothing until it's finished. Yeah. So well, I don't remember whether it's a half complete original. Excel formula, right? And similarly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the the other point about this kind of because you, you don't have the execution flow there means that there's a lot more freedom in terms of how you then implement it and how the language writers can can actually do the the how, right? So it's like just like if you tell a chef to go and bake a cake, he's got much more freedom in doing a really good job than if you tell him do this, then do that, and then do that, and you tell him how to do his job. So often what you'll find is with these declarative domain-specific languages, they can do a really good job of really efficiently getting what you want done because you've given them full freedom to work it out, basically. And yeah, but the domain of things that they can get done needs to be well specified beforehand. Or in the case of us building a complex game like the RPG, we become responsible for creating that domain. So we have imperative code, as Keith is saying, inside the classes like the player movement component or the AI control <coughs> component. That's yeah. all, still imperative code, but you we're doing declarative programming at the higher level. In the Unity Inspector, basically, it's all declarative programming. So I want to be able to put any component that is compatible on any game object and make it get that new property. If I put damageable, for instance, on a something on the ground, an NPC or, or a crate on the ground, that also wants to ideally become damageable. So things are order independent. The components can be added to any compatible object, etc. That's where you're declaring behaviors. So yep. you're already doing this, guys, in Unity and in Unreal. You just kind of what the whole point of this live stream is to give you the perspective and to credit Godot with the fact that it has helped us to gain this perspective that we're now giving you. Yep. All this confusion that we're raining down on you. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the former rather than the latter. But uh, yeah. It's it can they can be confusing topics, especially when talked about in the abstract. You know, you have to practice is is part of this, and you get a really good sense of it by getting a diverse set of practice. It's not just going in Unity and programming in C sharp for the rest of your life. You, I can't even remember who it was. It might have been Paul Graham, but then everything's attributed to Paul Graham. Um, that said that you should learn a new programming language every year. Um, no, that wasn't, it wasn't Paul Graham. I, I think I know who it was, but anyway. Um, so yeah, basically. I know who it was. It was this guy called Anon, A-N-O-N. He has so many Anon, quotes. Anon, he has so many quotes. Prolific. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. I to, because I used to think Anon was a real guy until my dad laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually the creator of uh, Mono who said that, I believe, um, who I can't remember what his name is. Um, Sodium glutamate. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So, yeah, it's definitely a good idea to always broaden your language horizons and always pick up something new. Don't get stuck in your ways because learning new languages just gives you such perspective on programming as a whole because programming is an art. Programming is um, more than the language. It is a much higher level concept than the particular language you actually express it in. So getting different perspectives on this beast is, is quite interesting, quite important. Can someone turn Somebody off the yellow light? Somebody's just pointed out the screen is yellow. Okay, so this is because um, I'm now using hardware to encode, and we're actually taking the HDMI output of my laptop. Um, and of course, when Flux, which I encourage you all to use because it makes your screen go yellow insidiously and slowly as the sun sets, and the sun is setting here in Cambridge, uh, you can't really see that because I can't, I'm going to show you out the window. Um, we know what really the sun looks like. I'm blinded in, but if I spin this round, you'll see that you can't really see, but you can sort of see that the sun is starting to set out Great there. Not really. 
Yeah, uh, not at all. It just looks bright. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it's my screen's going yellow, so therefore the piece of hardware is encoding the yellow, and therefore yellows are everywhere. And um, I fixed it. Um, I'm kind of with Keith, actually. He, um, can you see declarative as Lego brackets in a good way? Programming using pre-built objects in different ways to assemble the game however you want. Actually, that's exactly the metaphor I use. Um, when, as I keep going on about, Mikey and I sat down after the stream we did together and decided, let's make a game. Like The first thing we said is, what pieces do we need? Yep. And so we put the pieces in. And in fact, Sam played that game and it was insane and fun because yeah. I put a bug in that was just hilarious. Oh, the bug just made that game. Yeah, yeah there was a bug where <laughs> if you scored, there was a two second pause before the ball um, despawned. But if you bounce the ball off the net within that two seconds, it kept restarting that timer. And so the game became how many points can you get before it goes away? And like <laughs> people getting at 25. Um, oh, yeah, it was ridiculous. Like, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> okay, what I think I want to do is move on to the third major topic so that we've got plenty of time for questions. Yeah. So um, we've, we've covered, let's just recap what we've covered. We've covered, firstly, the idea of statically versus dynamically typed languages, statically yep. typed languages like C Sharp and C++, uh, inherently capable of achieving higher performance, but you're going to write more code. Uh, basically, C++, you're going to write the most code and get the most performance. C Sharp, you're going to write an intermediate amount of code and get an intermediate performance. And Python GD Script, you're going to write the least amount of code and get the least amount of performance. That's where you want to be, by the way, because 99% of your code is not going to be in a hot loop. Remember, um, digga, 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 brrr, digga, 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 yeah. digga. And value your time more than a computer's time, right? I think that's, uh, that's often the big companies like Facebook and Google all use the most productive tools because they know that they can buy a new server much more cheaply than they can hire more developers. Yep. Just remember, just remember in the game context that you're on somebody's Android phone and they've only got limited resources. So at some point you are going to have to optimize it up to a performance threshold. But yes, there you go. So then we went declarative versus imperative and we talked about telling the computer. So here's a quick pop quiz for you. Uh, how versus what? Declarative versus imperative. So which one is how? Um, this is for the audience. So if you're programming declaratively, are you telling the computer how to do its job or what to do? Declarative is how or what? Answer the question in your own head now. So declarative is what you want doing. Imperative is how you're going to do it. And now we're going to move on to a third fundamental paradigm, which is aggregation versus composition. Take it away, Sam. Share your screen. Do your thing. Okay. Right. Yeah, so aggregation versus composition. Better, by the way, than sharing your thing and doing your screen. But anyway. <laughs> People watching. Yes, yes, yes. We're hitting the gutter. So um, aggregation versus composition. There's, it's a really... So this kind of relates to... Well, if you have to understand what composition is in the first place. Composition is a lot like the components that we've just been talking about, is that you're building up what it means to have a player by putting lots of things that the player can do together and the player becomes the sum of its parts. So aggregation versus composition, there's a fine line between the two. So it's saying, for example, in aggregation that a pond is a collection of ducks or is made up of a collection of ducks versus say a car which has a carburetor. In the aggregation case, the difference is that when the pond ceases to exist, the ducks don't suddenly cease to exist. They might go off to another pond, they might frequent multiple ponds, but the fact that the pond no longer exists does not mean that the ducks stop existing. If the car stops existing, then the carburetor on its own stops making sense. It is a component of that car that makes the car work. Without a car, a carburetor is useless, whereas a duck is not useless necessarily. Without a pond, it might go to a river, for example. So we there's, there's a fine difference, and it doesn't make much sense on its own like this. But when you consider it in the case of Godot, you end up with scenes which are aggregation because you they all exist by themselves. You can have a scene which is the main scene that you actually play, but then you can have scenes that are representing, say, for example, just a character in that scene. And because it's ag aggregation and the characters can exist on their own, they don't have to be part of a scene to exist, then you can just go ahead and preview just that character or just that part of the scene. And you can build up a scene out of lots of self-sustaining, well, sort of 
independent things that can be exist on their own. And this is in direct kind of opposition to Unity, where a game object is cannot exist without living in a scene. So what you'll often have to do in Unity, and if you've used Unity, you'll be familiar with this, is if you've got a prefab or a component that you've created, you have to actually put it into a scene in order to see it working. So you have to often create these test scenes where you put game objects and components in some combination to actually test them out and see what they do versus in Godot, you can just go ahead and open up that test object directly and it'll work. So this is quite a big kind of positive point for Godot. And you can do something similar in Unreal because they have editors for actors. So you can see some preview of your actor. But still, if you want to actually play the actor or see the actor in motion, you have to go ahead and put it into a world. So it's not quite aggregation. So on the spectrum, Godot is much more aggregation focused so that everything can, can live on its own. So is, is that right that in Godot you can actually like preview each little scene, each component individually, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll let you stop sharing the screen so people can see me, but um, there I am. Hi. Uh, yeah, no, it's what you will do is you'll make a scene, you'll call it level one, and then you'll make a brand new scene and you'll go over there and you'll call it player or character, and then the player will inherit from that, whatever you're doing. And then you can instance in scenes, which actually the first time you do this can take a little bit of getting used to because like, well, is it a scene or isn't it? Scene doesn't mean location. Scene means, I guess, object. Um, it can be a location, it can be a player. And then within that player, you could instance, if you're doing character customization, for instance, the, the player's clothing, uh, the shoes they're wearing. Um, and at the same time, you be, can be instancing parts of the building and everything else. All to those things all independently, go just work just on that scene and just load it, you know, just the player by itself, just the hat by itself, uh, just that piece of pipe on the wall. And then when you go back to your, your overarching scene, level one, whatever it's called, you can bring them all in and they will update as you go. It's a, it's a really powerful way of working. Yeah, yeah, so that's definitely a, a positive trait. I mean, the idea of aggregation versus composition doesn't always mean this. So it's just really, it's a, it's a small distinction between two different relationships that objects can have in an object-oriented world. Um, but in practice, in Godot, this is what it means, is that it actually has this benefit. So in general, this won't always be the case with aggregation, just sometimes aggregation won't make sense if you, for example, are de designing a, a system that has you know, a car model in it and it has a carburetor. It doesn't make sense to use aggregation. It doesn't mean that aggregation is necessarily gonna be better for that. It's right. Like, that in this case, it's very useful to be able to have scenes that can, can live and work independently of uh, their parent scenes. It also means that you can have multiple people on the project working on different aspects and then bring them all in. That's right? super because useful. if you've got the right kind of version control and you can merge everything together, Ben could be making the, you know, the, the AI's behavior because he can code really well and Sam is really good at coding, but I'm just going to do the, the low level tweaking stuff that they don't have to worry about. And then we can just bring everything together in the same kind of workflow that you would do with your, you know, your technical um, illustrators, your, that's the, no, that's theater, um, your uh, artists, um, <laughs> the sound engineers, everything else, just bring everything together as its own scene, as its sub scene, and it'll just work. Yeah. Oh, ben seems to be muted. Or miming. Oh, miming. Yeah. <laughs> Badly. Oh, okay. That's it. <laughs> Good. Never be, I know they'll make yeah. a gif of that. Uh, please do. Please do make a gif of that. That will be my legacy. And, can someone please grab a screenshot of that and make it into a gif, please? Uh. <laughs> my perfect reputation has been tarnished. So I want to expand on that. There's actually something really powerful and grounding about looking. I've done quite a lot of work in Unity, particularly, and in Godot. Poor Yan the other day. I'm looking at a Godot project, and I'm going, yeah, no, we, we must spend the next hour working out exactly what file changes when you make that tiny change to code. He's like, oh, do we have to? But the, the, the thing about knowing exactly what files on the disk are changing when you make any given change is that you, it, it's super important for understanding two things, number, which are basically both the same thing, which is the concept that there's a place for everything and everything in its place. And we don't want information repeated. Or if it is repeated, it's repeated for good reasons. And we understand what is the master copy and what are the cached copies, right? So 
by understanding exactly what changes you're making on the disk, you have a couple of benefits. Firstly, you know, you get in the mindset of exactly where you're storing information. So for example, in Unity, when you first start and you do something in the scene, that's stored in the scene file. If you then prefab the object that you're doing that to, the changes you make get changed on that object. And if you then need to specialize that object further, you may split it out using scriptable objects or something else. Now, when you're collaborating in a team, the ability, the, the, having very, very clear about which files are going to change as a consequence of what you're doing becomes super important, not only for present, preventing you from duplicating data, but for allowing you to merge the changes of your work together. Uh, and having all of these different levers to pull these different directions to go in, and this type of level of understanding means that you can go off and structure your project in such a way that everybody can continue working and not getting blocked on top of each other. And ultimately, to do that, you need to know what files are changing on the disk. And to structure your project in such a way that, that everybody can have their own files that aren't standing on it, treading on each other's toes, you need to understand all this stuff. So, um, yeah, there's a little bit of perspective on that for you. And one thing that Godot does to really encourage that is because everything can be an instance, not just the scenes, but things like if you, I mean, like in Looney Lips, at one point we use a font. And then rather than reloading that font, you could just copy that font attribute and paste it. But what that means is that's actually an instance of the same font. So if you change that font anywhere, it will change everywhere you have used it. So you don't have to repeat that data. You can, but if you're paying attention and if you understand the engine and what it's doing, you can just write that data in one point, that code in one point, that asset at one point. And unless it needs to be a, a brand new thing, just save it as it is. Hmm. Yeah, and you can look a little bit more about this as the flyweight pattern is one example. Um, and I'll give you a link to Robert Nystrom's excellent book, which you can read the entirety of online, or you can go and buy the hard copy if you want to, um, to support him. So that's excellent an example, question. one example of, um, of using this type of aggregation versus composition thing properly. And there are loads of other patterns that use this. So, Sam, did you want to continue talking about aggregation versus composition? I know you've got some other pretty slides. It's time you stop showing yeah. our ugly faces and start showing your pretty slides. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so one of the other, yeah, let's, let's hide Ben's face quick. Right, so um, the, like following on from aggregation versus composition, it's actually composition versus inheritance because all of these engines support both composition and inheritance to a greater or lesser degree. And the point we, first of all, we have to understand what composition versus inheritance is. So often we reach for inheritance as a go-to tool because we like to think about things in terms of hierarchy, in terms of genealogy. So a great example in terms of genealogy is talking about mammals and reptiles. So what makes a mammal a mammal, perhaps that it can express milk. So that is um, this function that I have on the mammal superclass is that it can express milk and the reptile can lay eggs. So we end up with two classes and everything that derives from these classes will have all of the functionality of their parent classes. So all the mammals are, for example, elephants, cats, they're all going to be able to express milk and all the reptiles are going to be able to lay eggs. But then the problem is, and this always happens in programming, is you think you've got this nice neat, nice, neat genealogy, but then this weird case just comes along like a platypus, and you're just like, what on earth am I supposed to do? Which of these two is it supposed to inherit from? Now, depending on your language, you might be able to inherit from both, but then it's a bit weird. Generally, you want to be inheriting only ever from one thing, because what happens, for example, if they both share a function, what if both mammals and reptiles can walk, do you walk like a mammal or do you walk like a reptile when you inherit from both? It becomes really just bizarre. So for example, with the platypus, we don't know where it should go because it can both express milk and it can lay eggs. So in a composition approach, you would say, well, let's try and forget about setting up nice inheritance trees. And let's just talk about the capabilities and make things the sum of their parts, as Ben was talking about a little bit earlier, in terms of breaking up a player into it's AI controlled or it's player controlled, it's got movement, it's damageable and these things. And then you make your player just be the fact that it's a collection of these capabilities. So that's what we can do. We can end up with have a, having a milk making component, an egg laying component, and the elephant and the cat will only have the milk making component. They'll have probably other components too. So they might have a walking component. Um, then you have your reptiles, which will have like egg laying. But now you can also see there's some, the platypus can have both the milk making, the egg laying. You might have other components here, such as the snake will have a slithering component. 
um, and so on and so forth. So you're going to end up with lots of components making up what would have previously been a mammal and things that don't fit neatly into inheritance trees can just be reused. And composition is often a lot easier this way. There are some downsides to it because inheritance comes with some niceties, like you have the ability to say, well, if I know that I have a mammal, then I know that I can always call a certain function on it. If you've got composition, it, that can be a little bit harder. So that's uh, Absolutely. So Sam, we often get to, uh, to this discussion, uh, with, particularly in the RPG, as to whether we should be doing something with inheritance or composition. And ultimately, both of those approaches can compile down to, to something very similar. It's more about the human interface. It's more about um, what is going to be, e what is going to touch the le least files when I make a change? Remember, single responsibility principle, the idea that things should have a single reason to change. Yep. So if your code is such that when you try and make a single change to something seemingly simple, you have to change 20 files. You've got your structure inside out for that change. Now, you can't have your structure right for every type of change. But if you continuously find that the changes you're making are requiring you to touch loads of files, then you need to try and invert your structure and change it, turn the problem inside out. Yep. Um, and these types of abilities to dive into different programming paradigms allow you to do that and give you that flexibility. There's no right or wrong, but if the code is short and easy to read, then it's going to be easy to add to. Because remember, to read, to add to code, you need to read and understand code first. Mm -hmm. So keep your code really beautiful and human and clean and simple, and make sure that when you want to make a change, that it's very easy to reason about where you should be going to make that change. If I want to make a change to the way that the AI controls a player, I would hope that I can go and look at the player, find one of its components is AI control, and you go in there, and that's the only file you need to change. Yeah, and if yeah. you're structured like that, then it's good for those types of changes. Yeah, absolutely. You can and always find types of changes that require you to change every file, by the way, but that's just... There always will be, yeah. Find out what types of... History is the best indication of the future, so find out what types of changes you've been making recently as you discover your solution to your project or those requirements are imposed upon you, and then rework your code to, to, to be good for the types of changes you've been getting recently. And then if other types of changes come along, well, you've got enough different paradigms and ways of doing things that you can start changing it and refactoring it. Yeah. And above all else, keep your code readable. I mean, for me, a code should be a story. And I don't mean like I should read it like a story, like it should flow with the same kind of elegance as a story. It should make sense. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, and there's a point to it. And I know I'm bringing a very narrative bias to it because that's what I did at college. But yeah. Unless it's declarative. Um, you can have twists and turns, right? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> be unpredictable. Well, when you want it to be unpredictable. <laughs> if you want it to randomize, it should be random. Sorry, I'm if breaking, not, it I'm really breaking the analogy. <laughs> Storytelling bug. <laughs> so time-wise, guys, I think we are we started on time, which is remarkable. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. I want to keep this under an hour. So let's have a look for any stonking questions. Stonking and questions. really simple ones. Mark and Goodson. I'm an ex-old mainframe, COBOL even programmer with no knowledge of object orientation. How tricky is it going to be my to wrap my head around Godot? Is it OP only or a bit of a mix and match? Uh, ben, I think this might be one for you. From, I mean, it's it's pretty scripted and object orientated, right? The, the language is inherently, every, everything's objects. Um, yeah, but don't worry about it. It's very natural to, to, it's to not get hard to pick up. Yeah, you, know, you, you get your head around it very quickly. It's very simple. You write lines of code. This is the journey for a, for a beginner from where you are. You write lines of code. You get lots of, you want to reuse lines of code. You make functions. You get lots of functions. You realize that they share data. So that data that's shared between the functions becomes something called instance variables. And when you wrap up a certain number of functions and a little bit of data they need to share together, you've got something called an object. You try and make that object something that's a corollary to something real world, like a car or a toucan or a platypus or whatever, and you repeat and think about how those things talk to each other. It's not, it's not too hard. It's actually quite natural and good. Yeah. All right, moving on. Um, one from Rodrigo. So Godot is better for people who are less worried about going deep into the caveats of programming. Kind of. I mean, that's not its principal strength. It does allow you to do very fast work without worrying too much about what's happening at the memory level. But to be honest, most high-end languages do that anyway. And to be honest, if you're programming in C++ and Unreal, you're not worrying about the memory management too often either. Right. Um, that's being taken care of by the the U property system, and there's garbage collection going on for you automatically. I mean. Yeah, so there's there's lots of caveats to programming, and if you want to take the the messy approach, there's always you know 
you can always learn assembly. Um, but the yeah, I think often it's very helpful to take a high level high level view of things because the the key skill in programming is really that problem solving approach and yeah. being able to put together a solution out of parts and that's going to be useful all the way down um, when you understand the the intricacies of how your hardware's working and how you actually need to solve problems at the at the memory level at the performance level at cache cache line misses and so on and so forth i mean there's plenty of um, plenty of complexity all the way down all the way down to the silicon and beyond the silicon you know mm -hmm. as we found out recently with heart bleeds and whatever and um no not heart bleed what's the recent one meltdown specter those ones those you know, two yeah those are complexities happening down um below the silicon level basically people exploiting silicon level vulnerabilities in chips yep. so there's there's so much complexity if you want to go down to the atoms to the physics you know it's it's yeah you got to choose a level. <laughs> you got to choose. Really, I don't think that's. I mean, this is very much like what I was saying with Mike the other day. To me, the game isn't the engine. The game isn't the code. The game is the design, and that's true whether or not you're just doing pure game design or whether you're programming it. What's the problem and solution? That's your game, mm -hmm. right? And that's why, really, when people say, "Can I make this game in this engine?" Yes. What solution is going to use? That's where we're going to. Um, it's about Absolutely. Guys, yeah. I think what we need to do is to start wrapping up. So I, I've yeah. answered in text the question we had about the Unreal courses rather than doing that here because it's it's slightly tangential. Um, it's been a great stream. I'm so glad that the hardware has actually worked for us this time. That's, that's amazing. Got all sorts of cool things going on, like a monitor of the stream on my iPhone here. I can probably focus that for those geeks. That, well, you're all going to be geeks or you wouldn't be on this stream. So I've been able to monitor the stream like that and see uh, something about the bandwidth and what's going on. <laughs> cool. um, this lamp so has run out of batteries, which is why this looks much less pretty. Thanks for showing us that, Jan. And it's been great to have you here. Keep back in the Kickstarter. We get to 35,000. We get to uh, the next stretch goal, which is Unreal Multiplayer. Uh, sorry, Steam Multiplayer. No, I've got and Unreal Multiplayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be in a different course. Already is in a different course that I've just linked yep. to. And yep. I'd love to get Sam in to do some play testing and recording him um, winning drastically at all the games. Yes. Absolutely. And, and one of the questions Amazing. was, will we be teaching fundamental coding principles in this course? Yes. It's a beginner course, so we'll be going through everything. Uh, Jan will be covering that, and I will also be diving in with uh, instructor hangouts and other videos to explain coding from scratch yet again, so you get yet another angle on it. So thank you for being here, guys. I'm so glad the stream physically worked this time. And uh, we'll see you on the next one, which is, of course, tomorrow night is the end of Kickstarter closing party. Same time. It will actually be a play. celebration. And guys, thank you for getting us this level and for funding us and for all the support. We're really excited. So awesome work. Absolutely. Everybody. Please go back to Kickstarter if you haven't already. I'll give you a link. And uh, follow, also follow me on Kickstarter so that when the next one comes out, which will be much sooner than the last gap, then you're ready to jump on it. Thanks, Sam, for spreading your pearls of wisdom, mate. We really appreciate it, as always. Thanks, Sam. Awesome. <laughs> Take care, guys. All right. Take care, and I will see you shortly. Now, I hope Ned to work out how to stop the broadcast on this new hardware. Stop broadcast. Stop stream. Stop event.